Um, so today's class, I'm going to continue that example we looked at in yesterday's class. And we'll take that example forward to just introduce a little bit more theory. And essentially, that example will uh, we'll build up on it in successive ways to end off this section. So um, I hope you had a chance to review that example yesterday. We're simply going to just keep layering and building up on it. Um, just to quickly recap, though, the important points from yesterday's class was obviously introducing you to the terminology for the section. And then we also had that important side discussion uh, regarding flux being a, a ratio of transfer rate over transfer area. And as I emphasized, you'll, if you go look back at any of your prior work, whenever you have mass being exchanged or moved around or energy being moved around or exchanged, you will always find a driving force, you will always find a resistance. Okay? So that's an interesting challenge for yourself. If you go look, for example, I guess a number of you are taking 4K right now with Prashant. Right? Anyone taking the reactor design 4K? Right? So there's mass transfer through that catalyst pellet. What is your driving force? What is your resistance? Okay, if you're taking 3A, the heat transfer course that you have taken already with um, with Dr. Todd Hoare, you've looked at a transfer rate of energy per unit area of the heat exchanger. There's a driving force, the delta T, and there's a resistance. What is that resistance term in those cases, right? So I just to leave that to you as a constant challenge to, to look at that. It's all over in chemical engineering. Now, just some points that I want to, to emphasize that we're going to use in today's class. We, have two resistances of interest. RC, the first one over here, I'll just uh, put it up on the board, is equal to CS times V times alpha over area that we're filtering through. So that's my resistance due to the cake. V is my total volume of filtrate. And as we said in yesterday's class, that that resistance due to the cake, um, let's maybe just have a quick visual picture in our mind. We've got this this cross-sectional area that we're filtering through, we're building up this cake. And capital V refers to my total filtrate volume. Okay, so that's the volume of liquid that you collect um, beyond the barrier over there. So initially, just as you start this filtration, V is zero, you've collected no volume, you've got no cake resistance. There is no cake, in fact, when you've got zero volume of V. So you can't have any resistance due to the cake. So just as you start up that filtration, you have no cake resistance. As that cake starts to build up there on the medium, you get a resistance RC growing and growing increasingly over time. But the resistance RM due to the medium is always the same value. It doesn't vary over time. And what we find very often, and we'll use this today extensively, is that RM becomes so much smaller than RC. The medium, in fact, isn't doing any filter filtering for us anymore. The medium is simply there to provide the structure that holds the cake in place, but has no real resistance as compared to the cake itself. And so that leads to some desirable simplification. And then we combined those two in yesterday's class, and we ended up being able to start to use this equation, this very general equation up here. If we integrate it um, under, under some assumptions, and we made the assumption yesterday in particular that the numerator is constant, the delta P, so constant pressure filtration, we can get some, some easy simplification. We ended up with this equation over here. So I'll just quickly write it up. We're going to use this one again. T is equal to BV plus KP times V squared over 2. Now, B is a term that refers primarily to the medium's resistance. So notice the terms in B are the viscosity of the fluid, the pressure drop, the area. Okay. Remember, the delta P is fixed. And Rm is also fixed. So B is a constant. It, it doesn't change over time. And the key constant that B really helps give us an interpretation of B is that Rm value. It's essentially telling us B 
describes something about the medium. Okay, the terms in that, in, that co in that coefficient for B are related to the medium's resistance as well as to the configuration of our system. How much area we have, how much delta P we're providing, and the viscosity of the fluid. Okay, but essentially it's telling us the medium's resistance in, in, a, in a modified way. KP, on the other hand, is a term that depends primarily, notice there in the numerator, mu CS alpha. Okay, so apart from mu, we've got CS, we've got alpha, we've got A. But a so CS alpha over there, this is definitely related to the cake this time. The slurry concentration CS, how much solids we're putting in, alpha, the cake resistance, specific cake resistance, alpha. So that term KP can be interpreted as related to the cake. So if you wanted to understand this equation over here and try and explain this to someone, how might you explain that equation? What is this equation doing? What is the function of that equation? Maybe let me ask it to you this way. You've designed a filter unit with this equation and you're reviewing this work with a co-engineer in your company and they see this equation appear all over in your spreadsheets and your calculations, they're not familiar with it, what do you describe that equation as its purpose? Discuss it with yourselves and then I'd like one or two groups to give their perspective on it. Okay, any groups want to give a, their interpretation? I, I want to stress that this sort of interaction discussion that I periodically break you up into is so critical for learning, right? I see a number of you just sitting back and either intentionally or just because you don't want to engage in this, and that's quite okay, but I will say that you're minimizing the potential for learning in the class by doing so, okay? So I would encourage that strongly if that's something you're not doing just yet. Anyone or any group want to give an interpretation? Sean? It, uh, it shows the volume of filtrate you're getting with respect to time as the cake changes. Okay, volume of filtrate you're getting with respect to time. This is a batch process, so that's changing over time. Any other interpretations? Devin? Okay, the time required to get a certain amount of filtrate V, depending on two parts, the static resistance due to the medium and then the, the changing part due to the cake buildup. Okay, so that's a critical interpretation of that. Being able to explain your work to your colleagues is probably more important than being able to simply use that equation. We're always being reviewed by our coworkers. So being able to interact and explain that this is telling me the time it takes for getting a certain amount of filtrate due to the medium's resistance and due to the cake's resistance. Each one of these terms must have units of time. You can't add two terms that have different units. So BV must have units of time. KPV squared over 2 has units of time. Okay, so we get an in a sense then for how much time is built up in, in our filtration step due to the medium and how much time is due to the, uh, the cake itself. And we got a bit of a sense of that in yesterday's problem, which is why I started with that and had you plot the data. So let's just quickly put that up again. We started with this equation, you'll recall in our work, in our plan, we never actually did the equations, uh, did the calculations. I just ran through the plan with you and let you go home and derive those orange numbers yourself, which I hope you've 
you've uh, verified. And what we had done yesterday is we said, take the left and the right hand side and divide through by V. And when we plot now two axes, T over V on my vertical axis, and if I plot um, the, the time, sorry, the volume V on my horizontal axis, I'm going to get a straight line with slope of B. I'm just messing this up again here. I'm going to get a straight line with slope related to KP, and my intercept over here is going to be related to B. So let's just quickly write that up explicitly here, simplify that. So my intercept is B, my slope is KP over 2. I do want to point out that, and you'll see it here in the data, notice that those first two numbers, 37 and 38, in the last column over there. So it looks something like this. It almost looks as if the data does this and then goes up. And that's normal. Okay? The first few seconds of a filtration, there's no no real amount of cake built up. And we often notice this sort of flat line, which indicates that we've actually got constant volume filtration coming through, and then we get a kick up to a straight line. We typically ignore that part, so we don't fit our, our, our model to do have that sort of bend in it. We fit our model to simply project out to that point. Okay, but that very short initial period is just the cake uh, building up and getting that resistance going. So that's very, very typical infiltration experiments to see that sort of horizontal line. So as you did um, for, for yourself, you should have prove, proven that KP um, is equal to, let's just get that up again for you so you can, um, is it from yesterday? So KP is equal to 21.4 seconds per liter squared. And the intercept B was equal to 27 seconds per liter. If you go use those two equations, then you can go solve for what was asked for over here for RM and for alpha. So that was, that was all of yesterday's work. And I'd said I would take it on from part number five to calculate the cake resistance. And looking at that, you see that we're asked to calculate cake resistance at a particular time. And that's because, of course, as we've just discussed, cake resistance varies over time. So it's not a constant number. We have to calculate it at a particular moment in time. And in this case, we're calculating it right at the end of that experiment at 280 seconds. Okay, so if we had to plan for that um, in your calculations that you'd go do at home to verify that number 2.56 times 10 to the 11, we would use our equation that RC is CS times alpha V over A, and we have all those four terms on the right-hand side. So it's a simple substitution to go get that number. Okay, so with this simple data set, we can get RM, alpha, and RC. So three parameters of interest that tell us how the system behaves from a very simple, straightforward lab experiment. Now, I do want to emphasize here, and this is where we're going to lead on into the next section, that this was all done at a constant delta P, 38 kPa here in this example. So we were told... 38 kPa. I'm going to ask you to think for a minute. Do you have any expectation of how this plot will change if I redid this experiment at a higher pressure? Okay, I chose kPa, sorry, uh, delta P of 38 kPa for whatever reason in my lab experiment. 
Okay, but if I went to go repeat this work at a higher delta p, what would I expect in those data to change? Does alpha change? Does RM change? Does RC change? Okay, and once you've figured out which one of these three change or, or, or a combination of them that changes, how will that affect the slope? How will that affect the intercept? Okay, so have that discussion for a minute. Think through and Okay, so higher pressure or lower pressures. Um, let's just work with higher pressure, del a higher delta P will, what happens to the intercept? On the slope. So currently my, my line looks like this. Will, my, will this intercept shift higher, lower, stay the same? Lower, okay. So we expect that to drop down. Does the medium resistance change with delta P? No, okay, so that's an important point. KP, do we expect CS, alpha, V, or A to change? Okay, slurry concentration, that's my feed concentration. Definitely not, we don't expect A to change. The volume of the filtrates that we collect within a certain time won't change. I'm uh, sorry, will change. Yes, V will change. And alpha will also change. Let's take a look at alpha. Alpha is, our is the one that I want to focus on here. It, and it was a slide I skipped over yesterday. Kevin, yeah. For your uh, KP, isn't that the equation of RC, not KP? Did I write the wrong one? <laughs> yeah, because I'm, I'm looking at my notes. It's not matching up with what I have. Yeah, sorry, sorry for that. Uh. Just I'm overlapping my notes from yesterday and today, and so I'm a bit messed up here. Here we go. Okay, thanks for pointing that out. Okay, so mu CS alpha 
in the numerator. Mu doesn't change, CS doesn't change, alpha does change, and that's the part I want to talk about next. A doesn't change, and then delta P has changed, okay? So my, my slope might vary or will vary. It will certainly change due to delta P here in the denominator, but it will also change due to alpha in the numerator. And where that change for alpha comes is because alpha is given by this formula over here, the cake resistance. And the term that changes in, in that particular equation when we go to higher delta P's is the packing related to the porosity epsilon. Okay, so as we go to higher pressures, we have the possibility of packing those particles closer to each other. So the voidage or the porosity epsilon will become smaller. So epsilon becomes a smaller number at higher delta P. So I get a change in fact in the numerator and a change in the denominator over there. So it's not obvious which way it's going to go necessarily. Certainly the denominator will, do, will dominate with that um, to the power of three. So we expect alpha to go up. Okay, so it makes sense that for particles that have the ability to compress. So what I want you to have in mind is think of two types of particles. Think of rigid sand particles. If you apply pressure to a quantity of sand, you really can't make it pack any closer than it is already. Okay. So sand particles are what we say <laughs> insensitive to changes in pressure. Okay, we, say, we call them incompressible. If you think of a fine clay, so very fine like river type clay, when you apply greater pressure to that, and you've done that on maybe by pushing it in your hands, like playing, playing with that as a kid, you can compress that more and more with greater pressure, right? So you can get your alpha there to change. Your, that resistance due to the cake will change. There's also, any of you that have done a co-op term with filtration, I think I was speaking with Sean yesterday, um, with very fine silty material that you're trying to filter out, that will instantly clog up your filter cloth because it's, it just creates a cake that is so resistive because you, you're getting that compaction of very fine particles. Okay, So we can get a relationship of alpha with delta P. And what we will do is we'll get it in the following way. Alpha is alpha naught times a, a delta P raised to the power F. Now if F is equal to zero, if F is equal to zero, this term simplifies to one and alpha is alpha naught. We say then that is an incompressible cake. That material is insensitive to changes in pressure. But if f is a number different from 0, and it will be a number that's positive, so 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and, and slightly higher, then that indicates how alpha varies with delta p. And we can get that in, in a fairly easy way. In the prior example, what we just derived was calculating a single alpha value. So over here, I calculated an alpha number for you at a single value of delta P. If I redo that experiment at a different delta P, so some delta P value that's higher or a delta P value that's lower, I can develop a plot that looks as follows. I can plot log of delta P on the one axis and I can plot log alpha on the other. So this experiment I showed you the data for would be one data point. I'd go repeat all of that experiment at a different delta P, and I would get another and another and so forth. And the slope here is going to be an equation that relates log of alpha to um, and give me that F value. So log of alpha plus, excuse me. Okay. So my X value is log of delta P, my slope is F, my intercept is log alpha naught, and my Y value is log alpha. So that's how we determine that F coefficient. 
with a, sim with a simple set of lab experiments. You don't need to do these lab experiments if your material doesn't compact with pressure, but most materials do compact with pressure. And so we should repeat this filtration experiment at different delta p's to get an idea of what that F number is. Okay, so we're going to see that coming up in the, in the continuation of this problem. And we will often see that, that that F number shows up. Any questions on that before I move on to the continuing example? Okay, so let's see then, if we go over um, to this slide, I'm just giving you a visual picture of what the system looks like and then we'll take it on from there. So it's a plate and frame press now we were going to work with. And the prior work that we've just done was a lab experiment. So let's just go back to that quick, I'll just want to point out here quickly. This work was done in a lab. Here's an illustration of the lab equipment you would use. Notice we used the filter paper of 0 0.07 meters squared. So it's a very small piece of filter paper. And we've used a slurry that's 24 kilograms of solids per meter cubed. We do these lab experiments to then design and build our larger scale piece of equipment. So we're going to use that data now to design one of these plate and frame presses. So obviously when you do the lab experiments, you would use the same, the filter paper you would use would be the same medium that's used inside the larger press, right? So that you can get that correlation. But what's different obviously between the lab scale unit and this unit is the much greater surface area. And in these commercial units, you would also feed your solids at a higher concentration. So let's see how that takes place. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. So let's, um, let's just read through this together here. It says, we use that prior lab experiment data. And let's say we've determined alpha to have that sort of nonlinear relationship. There's alpha naught times delta P to the F. We're told that delta P is in pascals and alpha is in SI units. We're now going to operate a plate and frame filter press at delta P, 67 kPa, with a much, much greater solids concentration of 300. Now here's the part I want to point out to you, and, and Kushlani may have pointed out earlier. The cycle time for the filter is 45 minutes, and then there's 15 minutes of cleaning. So what that means is we take these plates, push them together, feed our solids through there for 45 minutes. We get a fil filtration going. We stop, pull the plates apart, and remove the solids, clean for 15 minutes, and we repeat. So it's a one hour total turnaround time but that unit is only operating for 45 minutes. Okay. In that 45 minutes, one, we can calculate that we're going to get eight and a half meters cubed of filtrate. Or you might put it another way. You say, I need to process that much filtrate in 45 minutes to, for downstream operation. So that's 8,500 liters or eight and a half meters cubed of filtrate that's produced. How many plates do we need? Okay, so you've done your lab experiment with the same material on a smaller scale. Now you want to design one of these larger units. The key requirement is obviously how many plates. Each plate is one meter squared. Okay, so each one of these sides is one meter squared. How many of those plates do we need to purchase? Okay, so again, no calculations, no calculator needed, but the planning here is non-obvious. Okay, so I'm going to give you about five minutes to work through this one. Um, there's some, some challenges here and this is an important part to go through. So work with someone else, work on your own, however you wish, um, but plan your approach for this. Okay, let's look at the uh, problem definition. Uh, we're, our goal here, which is what the define step is about, Our goal is to find that area, okay? Now, we can leave it like that. What do we, in the, in, also in the defined step, what we always write here is what we know and what we don't know.
Okay, and we're given pretty much everything there numerically for us. There might be a few unknowns that we come across as we um, explore. So don't ever feel that these, that these three steps are linear. Right? So we go backwards and forwards between them. We've given a whole lot of knowns there. Um, there's probably very little that we don't know. What I do want to um, talk about is the explore step. Firstly, in the explore step, ask yourself, is this a batch process or a continuous process? Batch process, OK. Um, we've got a 45-minute operation period, 15 cleaning, and then we repeat. So it's very much a batch cycle. Um, the other thing to ask is if pressure is constant. Delta P is constant. Okay, we can assume it given the problem information. Let's um, <laughs> just quickly have a side discussion on delta P. How is it possible to have systems running at delta P constant? How can you achieve a constant delta P? But right, where is the energy separating agent coming from in this process? Where is the delta P difference coming from in a filtration step? If we looked at this unit, right, what is forcing the material through those plates? Okay, so it's the, whatever the pressure difference is across the face of the plate, so it might be that we're drawing a vacuum on the downstream side or we're applying a positive pressure on the upstream side. Okay, can we set that up to get a constant pressure difference? Yes. Yeah, very easy. Simple feedback control loop will do that quite effectively for you. Okay, so you simple, you have instruments downstream, upstream, measure the pressures, calculate the delta P, and a quick PI loop can set up a constant delta P for you. Okay, so. The constant delta P is a fair assumption. It's easy to achieve in practice. So we can, we can go ahead with that delta P of 67,000 pascals. So that was the explore step. It's batch and uh, delta P is constant. Okay, or if it wasn't stated explicitly, making that assumption is a fair assumption. And because of that, we actually get falling out from that, that our equation that applies then is the one that we were working with earlier, is T is equal to BV plus KP V squared over 2. We can also, should and should assume here, that make a third Note here, assume the lab tests transfer fairly well to the larger scale. Okay, so what engineers will often do in this instance, if you're not comfortable going from a small laboratory scale to a large industrial scale unit, is we'll go to an intermediate pilot plant scale and just vary um, to an intermediate sized unit. And we'll often go do that at a third party company because they have that mid-sized equipment. Right? So we rent some time on someone else's equipment, go take some of our material over to their site, do some test work, and very verify that it does work, going from lab scale to some intermediate scale. The last thing you want to do is go from a small scale to a larger scale and then realize that something has happened, some other feature of the system that you haven't taken into account starts to show up at the larger scale, but now you've bought a million dollar filter press that really doesn't work so well. Okay, so this is very common to make um, that intermediate test. So we will assume here that we can go to a larger scale fairly easily. And now we can move on to calculate the area. What would be our plan? Anyone get to this point? 
Which equations apply? How would we use those equations? Devin? Okay. Okay, so there's quite a bit there. Let's just unpack what, what Devin's looked at it, or said there. So T is equal to BV plus KPV squared over 2. If we sub in for B and for KP, we can get that that's mu RM times V divided by the area showing up over there, minus delta P. So there's an area term in the denominator there. Plus the second term, if we sub in for KP, is mu CS alpha. And KP is equal to mu CS alpha over area squared times minus delta P. Okay. We know T on the left-hand side. We know viscosity. We know V, the volume of the filtrate, 8.5. I'm going to come back to RM just now. A is what we're solving for. Delta P, we're given mu, CS are given alpha. We can go easily calculate using that equation up there. Okay. Delta P, we're given down here in the denominator. V squared, we know, and A squared, we know. RM, just a quick discussion on RM. Can we get a value for RM? The medium's resistance. Okay, so again here, assume that our lab tests transfer to the larger scale Explicitly, that means Rm from the lab equals Rm from the filter press. Okay. I do have a question about that. Yeah. Um, obviously, like the picture you were showing there, it's a, a different membrane. Yeah. Um, how similar, like, I guess, you're trying to get them as similar as physically possible? Yeah. To have, like, the same thickness and rough and everything? Yeah. We're going to see how that plays out now. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Now, this is a messy equation to solve because you've got an a squared and an a, and you would, you could get this into the form of a quadratic equation. Okay, so you could get it into the form of something a squared plus something else a plus some other constant equals zero and solve for a. That's that is doable. But let's come back to that engineering thinking here on this equation. What do the individual terms on the right hand side there mean? We had said earlier in the class that BV is the time taken due to the medium's resistance. And the second term is the time taken due to the cake's resistance. Okay. A reasonable assumption is to take that away entirely. The medium really plays no important role. Over a 45 minute period, you're quickly going to set up a cake on that membrane surface. And then the membrane really is immaterial. It is only the cake that's going to affect how much time is required to achieve that 8.5. Okay, so that's a very, very reasonable assumption. And if you go ahead and do, so, do that, that simplifies this equation by removing that term over there. Okay, so solve then symbolically, it looks like A is equal to V squared over 2 times T times mu CS alpha over minus delta P, and you get 80.8 meters squared. So A squared, the area squared is equal to this term symbolically, and it's 80.8. .8. If you solve the quadratic, 
you got 80.9. Okay? So really no difference. It's within round of error. So save yourself a ton of time by making reasonable assumptions. Now, when you make an assumption like that, you always should go check it. And if you made this assumption when you were working on a midterm or in a test or in an exam, it's a very easy assumption to go verify. Remember I said in an earlier class, making assumptions doesn't say meet, absolve you from any responsibility. Making an assumption simply states at the top of your problem that you're going to come back to it later on and verify that that assumption is true. Not doing so is not, is not professional. So let's go check that assumption. Well, if you've calculated A, now you've calculated this value here in blue. Well, let's go sub in what that means. Okay, so if we now go calculate BV using this area of 80.8 .8 meters squared. Remember, we don't have the number in black, right? We haven't gone and done all the work. We've only done the work to calculate area in the blue there, 80.8. .8. If you go calculate BV using that figure, remember that's now equal to mu RMV over A times minus delta P you get a number of 113 seconds. Remember I had said earlier that that's a time-based quantity. Both terms are time-based quantities. If you calculate the other term, kpv squared over 2, and sub in for that, you get obviously 2,700 seconds, which is 45 minutes. And that's because you made that assumption that it's So if you're comparing 113 seconds to 45 minutes over here, that's, this is less than two minutes. And this is 45 minutes. It's a very, very reasonable assumption to make. Okay, so this proves then, this proves that our assumption is reasonable. Because that term BV is so much smaller. So that also answers Sean's question of whether it's a reasonable assumption that the lab's RM value, so this RM value from the lab, only affects BV. So even in the lab, if you'd used a filter paper and not the same type of medium as you use in the plate and frame press, you would still not be totally wrong. Okay, okay so... A few confused faces, that's quite normal, but go and work through those calculations and prove to yourself that that is a reasonable assumption to make. Okay, so in uh, Friday's class, I will just quickly end off the last two parts of this problem and we'll move over onto the new set of notes in, related uh, to class, cyclones. Uh, last Wednesday, we we're just going to quickly review this example, finish up the last uh, two parts, and then move on to the next section on cyclones. I just wanted to... Um, just emphasize the real importance of this example that we've been spending so much time on is because it really is how chemical engineers work with our designs for any systems. So you get to learn this and apply it elsewhere. So what we had done, uh, if you recall on Monday's class, we'd actually looked at a lab scale uh, system. So there is the lab version that you've, you've likely used prior. Um, small sample, small filter area, we apply a vacuum, draw it through there, and we can measure the amounts of filtrate over time. And what we did is we learned from that exercise the medium's resistance and the cake's resistance values. And what we could then do is go and apply that to designing a larger scale unit. Now, that would be the larger scale unit, and our particular goal in Wednesday's class was to calculate the area required. So in other words, how many of these plates do we need? I would also say that in practice, we likely wouldn't go from that very small system to this in one step. As I emphasized, we would go through an intermediate pilot plant stage, and um, you've actually seen a pilot unit uh, here in one of the earlier slides in the section over here. Um, this is actually in a brewery, this picture, but it, this is the pilot size. Right? It's no, no taller than that off the ground 
Um, you can see there the pressure gauge, stainless steel because this is in a food application. But essentially there's all your small, uh, the small plates uh, inside the larger frame. So that would be an intermediate sized unit and then you could go and design the larger scale unit from that. But uh, we did, we made the assumption that we could go straight to the larger scale. And we also then introduced in, yesterday, in Wednesday's class the idea that the cake resistance alpha has some base cake resistance alpha naught but is a function of pressure to an exponent f. And that's true for most, most systems. Most solids will have a non-zero f. If f is zero, uh, we call it, that an incompressible cake. So then in that case, alpha is just alpha naught. But most solids have some sort of compressibility factor f. And we showed in, in the class on Wednesday that by repeating that lab experiment several times at different delta p's, you could determine that exponent f. Okay, so that's what we've done here now in this larger scale problem. And all of last class was spent on calculating that area. Now I want you to consider that we've built this unit. We've got the, the unit installed. It's operating and at constant pressure we derived that the time taken to filter a given volume v, uh, v is given by BV plus KPV squared over 2. So that was our standard design equation from the prior class. And just to quickly expand those terms, T, B is equal to mu times RM over A, the area delta P. And I'm writing this out for a specific reason so that we can just uh, talk about some of the concepts here. The second term, Kp, there is equal to mu Cs alpha, alpha being my cake resistance, A squared here now in the denominator, and also a delta P. So both terms have an A times delta P in the denominator. Uh, here there's an additional A term, A squared, and then V squared over 2. Okay, so that's our standard equation for constant pressure filtration. And again, part of the important discussion in the prior class is that this first term, particularly because of Rm, but this entire term over here, whoops, I just realized I forgot a, B, a V here. This entire term is related to the medium's resistance. And a reasonable assumption that for long filtrations that that medium really presents a constant small resistance relative to the second term, which is the cake's resistance. Okay, so, so that's the, the knowledge of understanding you, you must have right now. And the question in part two is asking, if we have to double the slurry's concentration, what would be the required pressure drop so that we still get the same cycle time? Okay, so think about that for a second. This is really where most of the questions in this course focus around, are not necessarily on the design of the unit. Let's assume the unit is designed, so our area is fixed. We've got to work with this existing plate and frame press. But we want to do more than what we've done in the past. We now want to be able to process a solids concentration that's double the previous one. Something's got to give. We don't get free separation ability. Right? So if we want to process a solids concentration that has double the previous value, what is our new pressure drop going to have to be? So plan, how would you calculate that new delta P? What's your approach to take that? to do that. So I'll give you um, uh, two minutes to discuss that with the person next to you or on your own. Plan how you would calculate what that delta P is. There's no need to calculate it though.
it's optional and it's Firstly, uh, is the pressure drop going to have to be greater or smaller or the same? Greater, okay. So let's see why the CS term over here in the numerator is going to increase in magnitude. We want this T over here on the left to remain the same number. So it's We're going to adjust delta P. Is anything going to be affected here in the first term? Probably not. If we increase the pressure, the viscosity stays the same. Medians resistance is unaffected. A delta P over there, of course, will change. And V. But as we said in yesterday's class, this term can likely be assumed all pretty negligible. Right? We showed yesterday that that contribution is less than 5% uh, of the total time is due to the medium's resistance. So it's a fair assumption to ignore the complexity from that term and focus only on the second. And again, in the second term, CS is doubling. Mu is stays the same. Area stays the same. We're using the same filter press. Delta P is changing. Alpha. Alpha changes. OK. So. It's not as straightforward as it appears initially. Alpha does change, and so we must account for that. So we get, in fact, a new equation then. T is equal to mu CS alpha naught times delta P to the F over A squared minus delta P times V squared over 2. Okay, so that's our equation to then solve. We know everything in there. We plug in a value of CS that's twice the amount th that was given initially in the problem. So there we had 300. So now we use a value of 600 there for that new concentration. And you solve an equation that uses logs to deal with that exponent F. And you can get a minus delta P of 180 kPa. Okay, so just to contrast that, the prior value, when we were dealing with 300 uh, kilograms of solids per meters cubed of filtrate, there our prior value was delta P of 67 kPa. Okay. So doubling the concentration here is not just a straightforward doubling of delta P. So we don't go from, say, 67 to about 130. We actually need a much, much greater delta P. Okay. So we, again, you don't ever in engineering systems get something for nothing. If we want that increased processing ability on the solids concentration, doubling that more than doubles our ESA. Okay, This is why delta P is so important. This is what's actually costing us money on an hour-by-hour -hour basis to operate that unit, is to be able to supply that delta P. Okay, and in fact, what you can do is generate a plot that shows that. So here I've kept my area fixed, I've kept my time fixed, and I'm showing, showing you that for various slurry concentrations, 100, 200, 300, up to 800, you see that sort of climb there in the curve. It's not a linear curve. There's definitely an exponential shape to it. Okay, so we, we're seeing that, that increased cost. And you can, you can use this very quickly to 
decide on where you want to operate that unit for costing. There's another interesting aspect that one can look at in this problem. I didn't really um, touch on it there in the questions, but let's take a look back at this equation. So I'm going to just erase the medium's resistance term to make it a bit more clear here. Which other way could you work with the system to double that CS value and still get the same cycle time? Take a look at the equation. What else could you do as an engineer to still get the same cycle time but double the same double the CS value? Suggestions? Sean? Adjust the area. Adjust the area. Okay. So we can ab absolutely adjust the area. And what you'll notice there is that this square really works in your favor this time. Okay. Do you need to double the area? No. You only need 40% extra area, the square root of 2. So if you're doubling CS, you only need the square root of 2 multiplier of the area. So 40% extra space. And in a plate and frame filter press, that's one of the key advantages is those frame space open. So provided that there's room up in your frame, and we saw that there earlier in this example, right? So that blue outer plate can, can be pulled right over. There might be room to slot in extra plates there. And that might be the way that you get your increased capacity on the unit. Or some combination of increased area and then a slight increase in delta P. So two things. A is related to capital cost. And delta P is related to operating cost. So what we're saying is going to cost you something, either a capital cost upfront or an ongoing operating cost if you'd like to do that but it's not going to happen for free okay so uh, that's the line of thinking I'd like you to be taking in all the work we do in this course is don't just see units as static devices that sit there and operate at one condition they're always being changed and being repurposed for other uses okay, okay. any questions on the filtration section Okay, so let's, uh, let's take our uh, attention and then move on to the next topic.